hunger to win. It burns within each of these drivers. But the hunger to win the U.S. Nationals is something different. A win at Indy is the culmination of an entire lifetime of hopes and dreams. A win here is the ultimate accomplishment in drag racing. No career, no matter how story, no matter how prolific, is complete without a U.S. Nationals win. The anticipation builds as these men and women prepare to run for the NHRA's ultimate prize. For each one of these racers, the journey into drag racing immortality goes through Indianapolis. And that journey begins right now. Sports presents exclusive coverage of the $50 million NHRA Power Drag Racing Series. Today, live from the motorsports capital of the world in Indianapolis, we're qualifying, plus we've got the Skull Showdown for $100,000 at the 51st running of the Mac Tools U.S. Nationals. And welcome to Indianapolis Raceway Park, everybody, as we are experiencing a great weekend weather-wise. We've seen tremendous performance. If you missed our qualifying yesterday, all eight track records have been blown away. And let's talk a little bit about the Pedregon family, because one out of three is doing extremely well and it's Frank, not the guy you would normally think about. Yeah, Frank Pedregon, who's been running on a limited schedule all year, comes out here, runs a nice pass in his first qualifying session on Friday night, sat out yesterday afternoon, and then came back last night and just laid one down with a 473 elapsed time that puts him in the number three position for now. And then Tony Pedregon had some very frightening moments when the throttle stuck as they tried to lift the body. And we're uh, gonna be able to show you that. And that happened yesterday in the second session. Here it was, that's Cody Pendergrass as he tried to lift the body and luckily the only injury he sustained was a chipped tooth as he did a face plant watch on the left side of your screen that's dickie venables his pants literally get blown off by the force of the exhaust and he had first and second degree burns on his legs and that's a situation you know seven thousand horsepower remember these things just don't have a, a, a neutral basically it just you know, it's going to drive right through it, and you're not going to be able to hold it. And then Cruz Pedregon managed to go up in flames last night, and that's why we said two out of the three brothers not having a good time. And Cruz Pedregon was on a very good run last night, but uh, got out of the groove and then kicked the rods out. But what about Frank Pedregon? Look at that. Right down the racetrack last night, 473, number three qualifier. And uh, Frank right now qualified, but Cruz Pedregon, even though he's in the showdown, is not yet in the field, so he's got double the pressure. And uh, you've been there. You know what that's like. I think, you know, that's more of a situation for the crew chief because basically what Cruz has to do is he has to go up there and just get the car down the track as quick as it will go. If it gets loose and spins the tires, he's got to try to get recovered because if this competition is doing the same thing, he may still get the round win. But that means he could get the round win and still not be qualified in the show. So here we are coming back to you live track side. Chip Ellis will be in the left lane and Dan Kavasovich will be over in the right lane. And uh, Chip is solid in the field in the number four spot, but Dan in the number 19 position, and unfortunately, we only take 16. What, what a great job Chip Ellis did to get to the final yesterday they, uh, in, the, in the bike battle, but boy, uh, just fell off in that final round. I'm sure that was just eating him up because D.D. Tonga was there for the taking as far as with, with what he ran. Chip made his debut here at this event last year. Qualified on pole, if you remember. Chip goes 7.13 seconds. That's the quickest run of this fourth session. It will not improve him. He'll stay in the number four spot. And for Dan, well, he's going to have one more chance to try and punch his way in to the 16-bike field. Watch Chabellis. I mean, the key is the launch, and we saw from that back shot, the bike moved over towards the center of the lane right there. Now, it's right on the edge of the groove. In fact, it's a little bit out. Now, see how he corrected that. That back wheel just washed right out. Chip grabbed it, didn't make too big of a move. He stayed right on the edge of the groove, didn't get it towards the center towards it until after he got past half track. That's a very good driving job right there to be able to save that run. And that's the critical point on these pro stock mo motorcycles is that launch. Come back track side. You're looking at the Buddy Robinson. He is on the bump spot right now in the number 16 spot. Connie Cohen over in the right lane. She's trying to punch her way in. You got to run quicker than Buddy's 7.256. 
Connie. He's going to be taking delivery of a new s, &S mule here in the future. And uh, Vax G8, you loaned some of the parts to Chip Ellis for a semifinal matchup and uh, helped him get to the final round off of that new bike that they're still putting together, finish, uh, finishing up on. Connie's seventh trip to Indy. Don't worry about the red light on Buddy. It doesn't hurt you in qualifying. 729, no improvement at Connie. 740, nowhere close to being able to make it into the field. So Buddy stays on the bump spot right now as uh, he will stay there. And we've got uh, still a lot of more bikes coming your way. Uh, let's uh, bring up to date on Ken Johnson. Dave Reef. Well, Marty, Chip Ellis is 713. Certainly good news for that team, but not as good as having this man back. Ken Johnson, you just mentioned him. It's been about nine weeks since he had an ATV accident that actually cost him his lower left leg. But this is your first race back. i got to ask how you're feeling. I'm feeling good. You know, you get a little wore out towards the end of the day, but good and early like this, it ain't too bad. i got to ask you, too, because you said you have to pace yourself now. But George Bryce also said you put 70 hours in on that brand new bike. Chip Ellis is working. That's not really pacing, is it? Well, I was there doing a lot of supervising. I had uh, a lot of good help with us there, and we got that thing done. But I couldn't have done it without the good help, that's for sure, because I can't work like I used to, you know. I just got to change my ways and depend on other people. What have the last nine weeks been like for you? It's been a lot of physical therapy and a lot of prayer support and uh, just uh, the fans and the, the racers and just the big family supporting me so much and uh, of course my beautiful wife by me the whole time couldn't have done it without her and uh, like I say I've just been wanting to get back out of here as quick as I could. Have you had a chance to really think a lot about the ironies of you and George being teamed with Reggie Showers and PDI and how that came back with Jerry Schlenker to help you? If it wasn't for my experience with Reggie Showers racing pro stock bikes, it would have been much harder to make a decision and cut my leg off. I mean, they would have probably made me cut it off sooner or later, but it would have been a much harder decision. I talked with Reggie about it, and I talked to Tracy Slimger, who was sponsored Reggie for years, and uh, without them two and, and their concern and their their talks to me, you know, it, it would have been a lot different. I'm glad that I knew who I knew. And I, I, you know, I just can't say how much I appreciate their help too. Fan support pretty huge? Oh yeah, it's unbelievable the cards and letters I've gotten from people, just people I don't even know. But I'd like to thank everybody. We're certainly glad you're back. Pace yourself. I'll do it, thank you. Thank you, Dave. It is great to see him. And the reference to Reggie Showers, in case you're not uh, familiar with NHRA Power and Drag Racing, as we watched GT Tonglin yesterday's uh, winner in the Pro Bike Battle on the right lane, Gino Scali in the left. GT goes 7.12 seconds. That's now quickest run of the session. He'll stay number two. Gino stays in the number 11 spot. No improvement from his 7.20. We, you did see Kurt Mott also bump his way into the field. He's now in the number 16 spot. Let's talk about qualifying. Maximum five chances to get into the 16-car field. This is the only place we get five qualifying attempts. It's your best elapsed time that determines your position in the field. Speed's not a factor unless you run identical elapsed times with another racer. Only the clock is what you're worried about, not the driver in the other lane, and you do not get penalized for a red light. Now, we want to finish on that Reggie Showers. He is a double amputee, if you're not familiar with drag racing, and a 2003 Pro Stock Motorcycle winner here. He doubled up, in fact, won the Pro Bike Battle, and came back race day to win it. So, uh, that's what uh, the reference was with Ken. And we've got to take a commercial break. There's John Forrest. We'll talk to the team as John is on the verge of his first poll of 2005. That's right. You heard it correct. Poll number one. He hasn't had one all year. And that's one horsepower in downtown Indianapolis, right in front of the Capitol building. As we are at Indianapolis Raceway Park, 51st running in the Mac Tools U.S. Nationals. And during the commercial break, we're back live now. We'll show you what happened. Sean Gant, one of three finalists last year here at the U.S. Nationals, who was not qualified coming into today's action. But he goes in now with a 7.16 second elapsed time. And Sean is in the field. There is Team Force. We promised you before the break that we would see him. There they are. Let's bring in Gary.
Well, this trio right here, when you consider you get ready for the Skoll Showdown, $100,000, there are eight positions. You earn points throughout the year to get this opportunity. And John Force has got three drivers represented out of the eight. It doesn't get a whole lot better than that. How much pride, John, do you take in the fact that you've got three-eighths of this field? Well, I'm really proud because Eric's just done a terrific job this year winning races. Robert coming from behind with Jimmy Prock and AAA and putting that car in the Skoll Shootout. I couldn't be any prouder. And you will end up going against Robert in the first round. We've talked about this in the past. What's it like when you're going against not only your father-in-law, but the boss in the first round and 100 grand's on the line? Well, um, big payday. Um, I'm just going to make it fun. Um, you know, we don't have any points to worry about today. And um, what, what I can't believe is they won't let me work on his clutch today, for old time's sake. <laughs> And, of course, you got Eric Meadow over here, and he's arguably the hottest guy going in Funny Car Competition, having won, what, three of the last four events. What's turned your season around? Well, I don't know about the hottest. I think the hottest guy going right now is Robert. I mean, to make it in the Skull Showdown in a half a season, to me and John and everybody, I think that's unheard of. Our program just, um, it just kind of turned around on its own, you know, just a lot of hard work. Never stopped dreaming about winning races, and, uh, you know, we weren't having the season we hoped for, but... We knew that the season wasn't over, so there's no sense of just lying over dead and quitting. That's what John teaches us, never quit, so we never did. Got a couple wins under our belt. We'd be really happy to get some here, like John, uh, John and Robert said. It's all about fun today, and uh, a lot of pressure for a lot of money, but we don't get it anyway. It goes to him, so we'll just have fun. <laughs> so who's getting, the, who's getting the money? He's getting the money? The real truth, uh, the way we've kept this team together, Castrol and Ford and Mac Tool, is the fact that we share the money. That's the bottom line. Whoever wins, everyone takes home a check. But today is going to be some serious heads-up racing. It's not about points. It's about who's the best. And uh, I think uh, three of the best in the sport standing right here today. No, no argument on Mike. How, how can I become a member of this team? I, I want to get a piece of the action, Marty. Can, can you run 330 miles an hour with that microphone? Uh, I don't think so. Well, then you're out of luck, partner. All right, let's go to the track side and catch up with Antron Brown and Craig Treble. Antron in the left lane, Craig over in the right lane. And, of course, that first round of the showdown coming up a little bit later in our live broadcast here on ESPN2 and ESPN2 HD. Antron Brown, one of those guys that was able to double up with the pro bike battle in years past. He goes 7.10 seconds, quickest run of the session, 184, moves him into the number three spot ahead of Angel Sampe. So the first guy that we've really seen that has stepped up and improved. Yeah, one of the better bikes, but let me tell you something, in this session now, the bump spot has gone 500 quicker from a 725 to a 720. So these bikes, the conditions are there and the riders are getting a handle on it after three of the previous sessions. I think they're just getting a better ch uh, chance of getting that set up right. As they coast on out. One thing uh, John didn't talk about was uh, Ashley Force uh, sort of crashed a little bit earlier this week, and today she was in competition in alcohol, and there they are sitting on the set. Gene Snow, the man on the left, with our own Dave McClellan, 45th year here at the U.S. Nationals. Dave, you got to start beating up on Gene for taking out that young lady so harshly today. Well, you know, <laughs> this guy and I go back uh, well past 40 years uh, when he was racing in the Southwest and I was doing a lot of announcing there. Our guest is the legendary snowman himself, Gene Snow, and it seems like only yesterday, but in fact it was 41 years ago you won this race with what was a precursor to a funny car. I need to straighten that out. That was my dad. It wasn't me. <laughs> yeah, no. right. No. It was in, in 66 and 67, we were fortunate enough to win here with the funny car. Probably the first eliminators won with a funny car. But it wasn't a funny car eliminator at the time. It was comp eliminator in 66, super eliminator in 67. But it wasn't much longer before the world caught on to what funny cars really were. That's exactly right. Those guys were aggravated. We ran, uh, I think it was B altered and then C fuel dragster the next year. That old funny car showing up there and whipping those dragsters. But it was fun, and he got it started. And, uh, of course, I stayed in funny cars and went to the top fuel. It's really been fun. You are unique in a lot of ways. One, you're a, a master innovator. A lot of credit goes to you for developing the direct drive system that's in use on not only funny cars but top fuel today. And, of course, there's been a lot of technology added since those early days. But you also were one of the first with a multi-car team. I think that was, God, I can't even remember now. I had Chip Woodall and 
Terry Pringle and Jake Johnston and me in the funny car. Chip was in the dragster. Yeah, that was maybe the first multi-team. In uh, the nitro categories particularly, a lot of guys were teaming up maybe in the sportsman life. Indy means a lot to you. Here you are 41 years later. You're competing with an A-Fuel dragster, and you're beating the best still. It is absolutely amazing and phenomenal that everything has come together right here. The last time I was in I believe was in my top fuel car in 91. And what is this, uh, 14 years later, and just roll out here and the dead gun thing goes, you know, low ET on qualifying. I, I'm ecstatic. I don't know how to act. That's what you should be. Just have fun, Gene. You always have and always will. Thank you, David. Thank you very much, Marty. Thanks, you. guys. Appreciate it. If you saw a few technical hits in your screen, that's uh, our problem, not yours at home. We can tell you while they were chatting, Matt Smith moved to number two at 7.09. Here's the last bike of this fourth qualifying session, Andrew Hines, the pole sitter. Oh, he's out of the groove. You saw him leaning, and he still manages to get a 7.12 at 189. It uh, was actually a very slick and slippery ride, Mike. Yeah, as soon as he let the clutch out, that tire just started spinning big time, and that uh, what, what is what cost him. And when it did, watch, it just moves right over towards the center line. Bouncing that front end up. I mean, that thing is completely out of the groove at that point. Look at him lean the bike over with the front wheel turned. Then he straightens it back out. That's a wild ride. He's still not even in the groove till right about there. He's right on the edge of the groove, which he's just going past half track. Now he's in the center and leaning it back the other way so he can straighten it up to get it to the finish line. Upright. What a job he did there. I'm glad those guys are doing it and not me. And let's take a look at the standings with one session to go. Andrew's still on top of the heat, but Matt Smith, quickest run of that session at number two spot. And there's Joe DeSantis now on the bump, 7.205. And here are the guys and gals that have to try and punch their way in with only one shot remaining. In Pro Stock Motorcycle, we had 29 competitors. A total of 13 of them are going home by the end of today. We've got to take a commercial break. When we come back live, it'll be time for the factory hot rods here in qualifying session number four. Erica Enders, can she become the second woman to qualify at Indy? And there is Kurt Johnson. He is in a points battle with Greg Anderson, Jason Line. Back here live at the Back Tools U.S. Nationals, one of the most difficult jobs for these crews is trying to negotiate their way to the staging lanes. There's uh, Tommy Johnson through the Sea of Humanity. He uh, makes his way as we get ready for the Skull Showdown. A three-time winner is Ron Caps. He's not in the field this time. He's going to be watching. Harry? Ron Caps has had uh, situations with the showdown business in the past. You know what it's like for guys that are going after that $100,000. Does this become a play day for them? Yeah, it's it's a well. Today's weather really makes it nice because usually it's the most prestigious thing for a funny car driver, let alone be an in Indy. But to be in the showdown, we're not in it this year. But I know the feeling, and you gear up more than you do on a race day. It's an amazing feeling because you're also having to qualify. It counts as qualifying, so you're not want to deep stage and do anything. So as a driver, man, you got a lot on your mind. The big money. I remember when I won, my crew guys wrote money signs on the hand right before I staged the car. But That's why he wears a green shirt now. Huh? Yeah, color of money. But it's uh, it's one of the most awesome things to be in as a funny. You work all year for it, so uh, it's going to be fun to watch. How much of a disappointment because you're not one of the eight? It is, and uh, it was such a, a big weight lifted off our soldiers because we didn't, we didn't uh, make it in Memphis. It was like, okay, now let's concentrate on the championship. Let's concentrate on Monday at Indy. So today is, is, as the cup guys would say, we're in race trim. We're going to, you know, go after the race setup. And uh, so that that's kind of taken it. But do I miss it? Oh, man, I'd, I'd want to be in it so bad, especially with my old sponsor, Skull, sponsoring it um, and winning it three times. So, yeah, it's tough. You were involved yesterday indirectly in a, a very frightening situation. You were right behind Tony Pedregon when that incident happened on the start line. From your seat, what were the thoughts going through your mind when you saw that car lurch and go out of control? Wow, I mean, I... I I started crying in my helmet because I, I got on the radio to Ace when it happened. You know, I saw the whole thing and we, we kind of saw it coming and I was right behind him and, and I was afraid what was going to happen it did happen. And I, I got on the radio to Ace and I was afraid Rick was trapped under the car. I really thought he ran over Rick and I saw the guy fly and I saw Dickie get burned and, and him and it was just the most frightening thing. It was like watching my kid in a slow motion accident or something. It's just it was scary. So once 
Ace told me that Rick wasn't under the car and everything was all right. It was much better. But man, I, I, before I got out of the car, I mean, I was at tears. So it was an awful thing to watch. He was talking about Rick, Rick Stewart, who was the starter, of course, in that situation. I'm glad that everybody's glad that it turned out to the way it did. No serious injury. Have a good, safe day today. Enjoy it in race trim, if you will. Thanks, Gary. All right. Party. And there is Rick Stewart on the right side of your screen talking to Ray Alley as we get ready for our next pair in the pro stock. Jake Coughlin will be on line against Bob Benzik. Coughlin in the left lane. That's his radio. Jake, right now, number 13, Benza not in the 16 car field. Uh, Bruce Allen has punched his way in while we were talking to uh, Ron Caps. He is in the number 15 spot, moving Erica Enders down to the bump spot at 6.758. Saw some of the lower qualified uh, or higher qualified uh, pro stock motorcycles step up and improve a little bit. Okay, the better ones go. were were uh, still running right on their normal number. And, pro, and the pro stock cars were kind of seeing the same thing. I mean, the cars are running about the same ET. Ricky Smith did step up by a thousandth of a second and actually moved up one position. But uh, it's interesting. And we talked. We heard Ron talk about race trim. These pro stock cars are probably a lot more doing the same thing as the ones that are qualified, just trying to get a setup for tomorrow. Jake goes 6 point. 75 with a 6, 204-23. That will not improve his earlier run, a 675 with a 2, so he stays number 13. We both this thing up under the hood, so uh, not real sure where we missed it. Uh, felt pretty decent everywhere. Felt like it flagged its tail a little bit coming out of the hole on their net. It uh, was pretty good. Two-time Indy winner said wagging its tail out of the hole. Well, I think he was right. He didn't feel too much wrong with it, even though it did waggle. He had a 989-60 foot with the sun out. That's not bad early in the run. Like he said, there's probably not a, a whole lot more, you know, but every little bit counts when you're talking about trying to pick up just a thousandth of a second in these cars sometimes. Bob Benza did not make the 16-car field. We get ready now for Bob Pinella on the left lane. He is the number 22 qualifier. Mike Edwards over in the right lane. as uh, That is the brand-new GTO with the Young Life colors. Good to see Mike back. But while uh, we watch these guys, we want to bring in another one of the legends of the sport. There she is with Big Mac. Oh, you talk about legends. That's what Indy's all about. They're everywhere. No matter where you turn, there's a legend. <laughs> Legend. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Shirley Muldowney. Hello, David. Hi there, darling. How are you? Uh, never better. That is the best news I've heard. Three times a series champion. Indy has a special place in your heart like so many other racers. 1982 was the year. That's correct. And you won it all. Yes, we did in grand style. And, of course, we, we got by Coletta, Connie, uh, in the final. And, you know, that made it a little bit sweeter because we were all tied up in a guerrilla warfare at that time. But it, it had all worked out. Little did we know this was going to make this big circle. And here I am on the Coletta Zantrex team. It's, it's amazing to me how lucky I got all those years. I made the comment to one of the crew members who shall remain nameless. One of the funniest sights I thought I saw yesterday was Connie Coletta walking down the pit row with Shirley Muldowney on his back. Yeah, that's right. Emblazoned <laughs> on the back of his cruise ship. Well, it's part of, you know, I'm part of the Xantrex Strybecton team, and they chose to uh, put my name on the back of the guy's shirts, and I think that was as nice a compliment as I've ever gotten. I'm one of those lucky ones that actually grew up with your entire career. I remember the struggles you went through to be recognized. Early days. Early days, yes. What's your memories of that? Or do you try to put them out of the sight? Uh, no, mind? not at all. I, ch I cherish every single memory to say that, you know, I would change something. I don't think I would. I would do it the same. Uh, it, you know, it worked for me. That was my philosophy to go out there and be tough or strong is a better word. And it, it helped me through some of the, the tough days. But uh, a lot of those people that were not on my side in the old days, They'll come up to me today and want to visit and shake hands, and I'm, you know, I try to greet them with a with an open mind. I have often felt that Shirley Muldowney was the pioneer because out on the racetrack right now in pro stock is young Erica Enders, yes. and I wonder seriously if an Erica Enders would be occurring today had it not been for a Shirley Muldowney of the 60s and 70s. Well, they they constantly tell me how I broke the ground and I was the one that was their mentor and I was the one that made it possible. And I'm not so sure I want, would go that far. 
but it happened to be the timing was right. You know, it, it was my time. I was there, and, you know, it was just the way the timing was right. It's the way I attacked it. And to say that it maybe help the younger racers today. I'd like to think so. That's, uh, again, another compliment. One of our nearest friends mutually, Pancho Rendon. Thank you. I wanted to mention uh, Pancho's name. If not for Bobby Rendon out of Roseville, Michigan, uh, but 30 years ago, that man let me drive his top fuel car, thought enough of me to give me his car and let me go up to Cayuga, and I upgraded my license, which, which Garlitz, Ivo, and Coletta signed. But without Bobby Bobby Rendon, I wouldn't really have been in top fuel as early as I was. And Bobby's very ill today, and uh, you know, I just want him to know that we all love him, and he has uh, a bundle of friends that are wishing the best for him. I will second every word of that. We have available to us the pictures of you winning, the video oh of you winning here in 1982, and you get to relive it again vicariously, of course, sitting here on the set. But uh, memories will never be taken away from you of that weekend. No, that was my golden weekend. And, you know, I look at the cars then going 250 miles an hour and I say, God, you look like we're crawling. <laughs> when you look at 330, you know, there's a big gap there. But th thankfully, I was able to enjoy 300 plus miles an hour before I retired. And uh, actually, in our last year, we ran our quickest and fastest time ever. So we went out in style. I've been asked to ask you about your license plate. What does it say? It, I'm waiting for someone to steal it, but it says I and the letter, the number one, and it says Indy. That is, again, that was my day, and I wouldn't trade it for all the championships in the world. I have said it many times before, and you just validated it. To the racer, this is it. This is it. There is nothing else like Indy. That's it. Sure. Thank you, sir. Bless your dear, and thank you. Best of luck to your team and all the gang over there and the oh, Colorado yeah. Racing Team. Root for Big Blue <laughs> and Big Red. All right. Back to you, Marty. All right. Thanks. That was so much fun visiting with Shirley Muldowney and sharing those moments again as we take a look at Alan Johnson and Jim Yates. And Alan goes 6.757. And Alan's already in the field in the number 11 spot. But Jim Yates with that brand new car, he's going to have one shot left. You can see he's number 17. That's not quite good enough. Erica Enders has it on speed. She ran 204.14, and that was uh, better than Jim Yates' speed. You're looking at Jason Line. He'll be in the left lane, and Greg Anderson will be over in the right lane. Our final pair of pro stockers here in session number four. We still have one more qualifying session to go. Now, Greg has been quickest every time out. He's been crushing everybody by three, four one-hundredths of a second. So far, Warren was uh, quickest this session, 6.72 seconds. So if Greg keeps pace, he's going to be dipping back into the 60s. You know, he, he's been making unbelievable runs because we know he has a horsepower, but so does Warren, so does Kurt, so does Jason Lyon, but Greg Anderson has been making perfect runs like we just talked about. He's he's getting the right amount of top wheel speed early in the run. You watch the front end's not lifting way up. You want to lift up just a little bit. That means the car's accelerating forward rather than wasting a lot of motion off that launch. Gives him a good 60 foot. Then he's hitting the shift points just right like he's done so many times. And with that horsepower on the other end, he's just making great passes. go 6.69 he's dipped into the 60s again 205.51 miles an hour will not be good enough to retake the speed record but he stays number one is quickest again in this fourth session and the uh, 205.66 from warren johnson will stay as the speed mark 205 and i'm sorry it is a 205.72 for greg i was looking at his early so, yes, he does hold the tr both ends of the track record again and says, Warren, take that. Watch him. He's not making a whole lot of movement on that steering wheel. That's the key there. It's not getting loose. It's going right down the middle of the racetrack, hitting the shift points just perfect and making that perfect run every time down the track this weekend. So Greg is still the only car in the 660 range here in Pro Stock. And again, if you're just tuning in, last year's track record was 6.78 seconds. You gotta be 300 quicker just to be on the bump spot with Erica Enders at a 675. 
Where does a 678 get you? Number 23 with Ronnie Humphrey. That's how good Pro Stock is here at the 51st running of the Mac Tools U.S. Nationals. 34 drivers, and a lot of them are going to be going home. Hey, let's shift gears again. We talk about legends of the sport. There is another one who has had a very busy weekend. Big Mac? Marty, the nice thing about Indy, I get to run into people that I met 45 years ago, and this guy was driving for a Prentice Cunningham. Whoa. That's a long time ago when we first met, but Kenny Bernstein is a 69-time national event winner. You picked up, uh, what, uh, the funny car title here? You also won right. Top Fuel one time. But right now, you're a team owner, and you're also the president of PRO, the Professional Racers Organization. Right. And PRO has done something really big this weekend. Yeah, we're real proud of, of PRO and uh, what we've accomplished over the years. But this weekend may be the, 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 the best star that you can put up there. This is the gold one. Uh, and it, it, we owe a lot to, uh, to the membership and to the organization itself. But uh, in a meeting on uh, a couple of days ago, uh, John Force uh, brought up the fact that we've got a disaster in Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama. What can we do to help with that? And we all discussed it. The pro board uh, elected to put $25,000 to that to that area uh, as a donation. And then lo and behold, the membership wanted to get involved. And next thing you know, the membership and the organization together got $150,000 for, for the, the relief of the estimate down there. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm really the, happy for them. You know, a tip of the hat to all the the guys and gals that went into their pocketbooks and wallets to fund that because that's a sizable chunk of change. Oh, it really is. I mean, there were guys right there that stepped to the table for a, a ton of money. I mean, Don Schumacher, John Forrest, Connie Coletta, I could go on, Doug Herbert, everybody basically jumped in. And the guys that couldn't afford a lot, they jumped in with a couple of grand here and there. And, uh, and Jim Gennard from Oakley, he put in 25 grand to the program and Mopar and, uh, and, and myself. I mean, we all did. The next thing I know, I mean, in about 15 minutes, we raised 150 grand. I said, boy, if we could raise sponsorship money this quick, I'd be back in a race car. Yeah, I know. You were talking earlier. Somebody gave you six or seven million. Yeah, You'd let's go. back driving yeah. again. Yeah. Well, I'm going to let you relive 1983, your yeah. very first win here. Tell us about it. Well, it was a unique situation to begin with. We'd been struggling pretty good most of the year, and then Dale Armstrong really got it put together at Brainerd the week before, which we won, and we came to Indy. And the next thing I know, we win Indy and the big bud shootout with the Budweiser team. Funny car, and no one had ever done the back-to-back, -back. and I tell you, it was something very special. And that kind of set the stage on for the Budweiser King team to carry on in 84 and start that championship run that we were able to make. Well, 91, you also went back to the winner's circle, and we've got that video as well. What was that win like? Well, you know, now that's a, that's a strange one there because obviously uh, we did well that day, but in the final, we, we basically got a nice little ride in the final. The car we were racing at that time uh, broke on its burnout, so we got a single. And I think I went about two inches and smoked the tires and just coasted down through there for the win. That was a heck of a way to win the U.S. Nationals, but, I, you know, you take them any way you can. As they say, there's no asterisk in the record. Well, book. it's kind of like golf. You know, when you get a, a birdie on a, on a par four and, and, and it's pretty ugly birdie, it's still a three. <laughs> a three, that's exactly right. Just in the past few months, your dad, Bert, passed away. Yeah. And I have often wondered, because a lot of folks uh, in drag racing say my parents were not supportive of what I did. How about your dad? No, just the opposite. In fact, I owe my father so much from the business world from the day I was born to, to today, even as far as that goes, the last week before he passed away. He, he taught me so much in the business world and how to operate and how to work properly and do it. He supported the racing, the athletics from day one. In fact, when I was 12 years old, he was my crew chief on my quarter midget and my half midget. That gives you an idea of how supportive he was. And he wasn't a mechanical man. He was in the retail business, so he wasn't mechanically inclined to do that kind of work. But he, he, he supported everything I did. And I tell you, I, I can't say enough for the fans and the, and, the, and, the, and the people in our sport, our family, our competitors, everyone that has sent emails and cards and, and phone calls. I, I wish I could call every one of you back, write every one of you back, but whoever's listening out there, thank you so much. And uh, my dad loved all of you. And I tell you, it was very special in St. Louis, Missouri for him. We knew we were getting close to the end. We wanted him to come there and we got a break and won a race and he was there and Brandon was driving. So couldn't have asked for a better time. And he didn't suffer any in his last three months of life he had a, a pretty good quality of life and that was most important to him and to us well from all of us our thoughts and prayers are with you Thank and you your so very whole family much. too
There's a lot of rumors going around in this pit. One of them entails your team and an extension on the contract for Brandon. Is that uh, oh, a yeah, plausible thing? Yes, that's true. We have uh, we have agreed to terms with Budweiser for four more years, which takes us to, to 09, which will be our 30th year with wow. Budweiser, which is phenomenal. In fact, we have the contract right now. So uh, we're reviewing that, and it's just a matter of signing it, and then the f official announcement can be made. But uh, we're tickled. Uh, they've been a family for us for so long. Uh, uh, you know, our Budweiser, our Lucas, our Mac Tools, all these people, New Era hats, and, and everybody. But Budweiser's been the family for now 26 years, and uh, to extend it another four is just phenomenal. Just like the Prentice Cunningham days. Well, you know, you said that, and I thought of Carlisle, Arkansas. <laughs> That's exactly right. Where I started my announcing career, Kenny Bernstein, thanks so much for stopping my by. My pleasure, Mac. It's a pleasure to be here. and Thank everybody at ESPN. We appreciate it. You bet. Marty? All right, thanks, Mac. And so you get the latest news involving Kenny's future in 30 years. It's, well, we still don't got 15 to catch up to Mac here at the U.S. Nationals. There's Corey Mack as he's signing autographs down at the pits, and that's one of the great things here in NHRA Power 8 Drag Racing. And that's an overhead camera that we have in Corey Mack's pit, so that when they do the 75-minute turnaround, you're going to get a bird's-eye view and be able to watch that ballet that they perform between rounds. Now, we've got to take commercial break. There is Cruz. His hair's getting a little longer. Said he wouldn't cut it till he wins a race. Can he turn that around? Well, first, he's got to get into the field. When we come back, it will be time to talk about the Skull Showdown. First round is coming up. Dell Worsham, Gary Selsey, Eric Medlin, and the only guy who has won it out of this group, right there, John Force. Stay with us. Under absolutely perfect conditions, it's another magnificent day here in central Indiana and Indianapolis Raceway Park. We're all gathered, of course, for the 51st edition of the U.S. Nationals. Qualifying continues, and of course, today we will have $100,000 shortly on the line in the Skoll Showdown. To qualify for the Skoll Showdown, well, you get one of these hats. That makes you an all-star. Only eight men have earned enough points over the last year since they last ran here at Indianapolis to qualify for the showdown. One of them is Cruz Pedregon. Here's your hat, my friend. I know you got the advanced auto parts on your head at the moment. There are major concerns for you. Obviously, you're delighted you get to battle for $100,000, but maybe more importantly, you're not yet qualified for tomorrow's finals. Which is occupying your mind the most? Well, I've got to race the car in shallow stage, which means I have to get the maximum ET, but I think both. I, I definitely want to qualify to, to, for tomorrow's race, but, you know, uh, it's a big it's a big payday out here thanks to Skull, so we're we're going to do all we can to do both, get a win. We have a tough opponent against Gary Selzy. We're going to try to get the win and qualify, and it's a tough task. We can do it. Our car's been really trying to run good all weekend. We've been shooting ourselves in the foot. I got it out of the groove one run. We we had a, a parts failure on another run, and so a car's trying to fly. It was maybe going to run low ET last night, so for all my advanced auto parts fans and teams out there, just hey, hang in there. We're going to run. It's a little condi warmer conditions today, so we'll have to race the track today. And they say that that's the great equalizer. I want to ask you about hurricane relief, among other things. You've got a Carlos Santana guitar that you've unveiled, and it's up for bids online at PedregonRacing.com. And all the proceeds are going to benefit a variety of sources, right? Well, yes, there's three charities. There's a JDRF, Ju Juvenile Diabetes, uh, uh, JDRF, Juvenile Diabetes Program that Advanced Auto Parts supports, research program, Carlos Santana's Milagro Foundation, and the relief effort down in Louisiana. So it's a great cause. Uh, you know, Santana's a great name. And uh, send your bids in, cruisepedregon.com, and uh, hopefully we can get some relief to some of those folks that need it. Boy, and I saw that guitar just a little while ago. Let me tell you, it's sweet. Go get him, Cruiser. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, I could probably play the gar guitar about as well as I could drive one of those race cars, so... <laughs> but it is sharp. All right, let's talk about what's coming up later tonight right here on ESPN2 and ESPN2 HD. The Mac Tools U.S. National Final Qualifying, your final shot to get into the 16-car field, plus the finals of the Skoll Showdown. That's at 10.30 Eastern Time, 7.30 Pacific. Then tomorrow, we'll kick it off with a special edition of NHRA Today at 11.30 a.m. Eastern, early eliminations at noon, and then final eliminations at 8 Eastern. For more, just log on to ESPN. Com. Well, we talked about uh, renaming this racetrack uh, Schumacher Raceway Park because of the success that those guys sitting with uh, Dave McClellan have had. Big Mac? Well, the one on the, my far right, uh, the one that's more my age, a little bit younger yet, but still of the older generation, 
35 years ago visited the winner's circle at this racetrack. The driver of the Stardust car, Don Schumacher. Don, a pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here once again. That was 1970, and I raced against the Ram Chargers, Leroy Goldstein. Hey, you were great in that. We'll come back to you in a moment. All eyes are focused on your son, Tony, in the U.S. Army car. You're going for your fourth win consecutively at the biggest race of them all do you feel the pressure you know uh all in all we're gonna let that pressure go we're gonna stage the car and i've been doing a lot of thinking about that and last year when we were sitting on the roll cage right here we were going for our third win and i thought to myself wow this is a big round i mean big daddy don garlic was the only man ever to win three in a row and to be able to put yourself even on the list to go for a race like that to have a team of that caliber that can do something like that is an honor it's a pleasure to be able to drive that car, and I thought, you know what? Let's forget about the pressure. Let's remember when we were just a young kid how much we couldn't wait to get in the race car because this is about a good time. We're having fun doing it, and it's real easy to lose track of that and put the weight of the world on you and make mistakes, and we got to let that go. We're going to go up here on Monday. We're going to go here tomorrow with the greatest race cars this track has ever seen and the greatest race team in top fuel. But we need to stay focused, be like a machine, and try to win that round. Well, that's what it's going to take. Just don't plan too far ahead. Take it a round at a time. That's what you did in 1970 and believe it or not through the magic of videotape we get to live it again you and the ram chargers <laughs> side by side here at indy what was that like it was just a great day for me i mean it was really the beginning of my career as being successful 67 68 the winner out in california that that really started my career but winning indy the nhra nationals in 1970 that really took me to a plateau that has allowed me to come back here in 1999 and begin this team the first full year that i started racing with tony uh, with the excite batteries car that allowed us to build this team that we have today with the nine different drivers the different sponsors i have and just the tremendous success that this team has had i mean these people that are together and work together is just incredible. You know, the Powerade brand is part of the Coca-Cola empire, but Coca-Cola was involved in drag racing in a big way a long time ago, and you were a mainstay of that, the Coca-Cola cavalcade of funny cars. It was a, a really a, an amazing time back then that Coca-Cola got involved, and it was through an advertising agency out of Chicago that they got involved in the sport, and we ran all over the country and just had a great, great time. We were really nomads back then, I mean, uh, kind of gypsies. We ran all over the country. You have to think back. There weren't toll roads or expressways. It was mainly two-lane roads, lots of miles from racetrack to racetrack. We'd run three, four times a week, every re week, basically. It was a great life. We had a good, good time. And that's what's created what we have today. And what we have today is something you grew up with. Did you ever get to watch your dad race? Well, he quit when I was five years old. But uh, it's actually this race, the U.S. Nationals growing up with Tommy Ivo and Beetle and these guys driving through on the way to Indianapolis to the U.S. Nationals, stopping at our house in Chicago uh, and listening to the stories. You know, when, when you're a kid, it all is so big. But listening to these guys and Shirley Muldowney and Don Garlitz and talk about how great racing was and what a great life it was, that gets you started. That gives you the idea because it was 11 years from, from when my dad quit before I drove a car at all and went to the local racetrack to do it. So uh, I didn't have my sights set on top fuel. I was having a good time with some good friends. Uh, but the stories of the past that I got to hear at dinner time uh, quite often, you know, and, and coming to the U.S. Nationals, we used to park the car right there on the finish line, watch the cars come by. They'd lift the blowers off. Everyone would look up, fall off the back of the motorhome, you know, and uh, it was awesome. It was just something, you know, growing up, you think, wow, everyone has to pick their job and their career in life, and this is where I want to be. So uh, I, it is uh, for us, it's a way of life. We wouldn't know anything else. It is just outstanding. We love doing it. And that's what I mean when people say, wow, there's a lot of pressure at this race. Wait a minute here. There is a lot of pressure because we're professionals. But let's face it, we're doing something that a lot of people would like to do. We really, really enjoy it. We have to remember those moments because they're the ones that create those big moments. It still is fun, guys. Absolutely. And that's what it's all about. 
Don Schumacher, Tony Schumacher, best of luck to you with your top fuel car. You with the entire menagerie of cars that you have under the Schumacher Racing Camp. We thank you very much for thank joining you. us and best of luck to both of you. Thank you very, very much. We appreciate being here and being able to do this as a family again. Oh, it's so much fun. Thank you, guys. Marty. And their 70,000 square foot shop a little more than a mile away from this racetrack. And down track side, there are the introductions going on for the Skull showdown. Let's talk about the matchups. John Force, for the first time in history of the showdown, races one of his teammates in the first round. He's lost in the final the last two years. And then it'll be Del Worsham up against Tony Pedregon, Selzy and Cruz Pedregon with Gary having the lane choice, and Eric Medlin with the lane choice over Tommy Johnson Jr. That's the eight-car field, and as we get ready for live coverage here in first round action and there is tommy johnson standing on the podium as uh, we've got to take a commercial break stay with us when we come back we'll talk about last year's winner gary densham back here live at the mac tools u.s nationals indianapolis raceway park that's a great view from up atop the press tower and some of the suites that are located here on the track as we are getting ready for the Skull Showdown, the all-star race where you can win $100,000 today and then another $50,000 if you double up by winning tomorrow. And the last guy to do it was Gary Denton. Force is the only guy who's done it twice, 93 and 96. Jim White, Don Perdome, and you heard from Kenny Bernstein when he pulled the trick back in 1983. We promised you that we'd talk a little bit about Gary Denton. Well, let's take a trip back to last year when Gary was with Team Force and won. Showed up, qualified pretty well on Friday and Saturday. Thought, well, hey, we got a chance of it. Both cars labored, but it was Del Worsham going up in smoke first. So Gary Densham does advance. Actually got pretty lucky in the first couple rounds. Smoke tires, the other cars ran, uh, you know, pretty good, but they smoked tires too, so they were able to win. Going into the final round with John Force, where they could, well, you know, not only is this our boss, but he's running a lot better than we are. Gary Denchy, my trouble A, he knows how much I love him. I'm coming after you, Denchy. <laughs> a great drag race, and Gary Denchy and Jimmy Crock have got it. I remember thinking, God, I'm so happy to do it. And I looked over at Forrest, and I thought, did I just get fired by winning this race? Denchy, you're still fired. <laughs> but, you know, John being the type of guy he is, of course, he gets a check anyway. Uh, he was all happy for us. Uh, he's a good man. I'm very proud of him, what he's done for us. Unlike winning other races, when you were in the showdown, the whole crowd is still there. So as we passed in front of this grandstand, I'm thinking, here's 100,000 people on their feet cheering Gary Densham. I've never seen anything like that. It was almost like being in a daze with all those spectators, all those fans and the media to be able to win that race. And, and yet, in some ways, in all ways actually, as great as that is that happened to work all year long to be able to qualify for it, the biggest payday of, of any race in our entire circuit, it's still not winning the U.S. National because that's gonna go down in history forever, especially the 50th anniversary. and a $250,000 payday. Gary Ditchum, let me tell you something, there's a guy that's proved it 30 years of being a pro, and, and all he needed was a good race car. And to go out here and win and then to double up, only a few have ever done that. I don't even think it really actually set in until a day later when I was driving home in the motorhome. I think we were someplace in Oklahoma, and all of a sudden I, I just pulled over the side of the road, and I looked at my wife, and I said, you realize we won? not only the Skull Showdown, but the 50th anniversary U.S. National. I mean, how can life be any better? It was a very great day for Gary Denchum, and he has run his best run this year, this weekend, with his own team, right here at Indianapolis Raceway Park. Will it be good enough on Monday? Well, we'll find out. Stay with us. We've got a lot more still going on. The introductions continue. There's Gary Selzy on the left, as we'll come back live to the Mac Tools U.S. National. Oh, look who that guy is.
back here live at the Mac Tools U.S. Nationals at Indianapolis Raceway Park as uh, we are getting ready for first round action in the Skull Showdown. They've just uh, finished up and wrapping up the introductions to the crowd here. And uh, let's uh, take time to get caught up with the man who tuned the winner, Gary Dencham, last year. That's Jimmy Brock. He's with Gary. Always an interesting process as you get close to the first round of eliminations in the Skoll Showdown. And remember, Jimmy Prock is a man who tuned Gary Dencham to a win a year ago. You walk the track. You, you make so many assessments. What are you looking for? What conclusions have you come to, Jimmy? Well, we look at the condition of the rubber to how, how thick it is. Uh, you know, they just scraped it down, so that helped. We take the temperature into consideration. And then over in this lane here, we got a... A lot of times we have to start outside here and get the thing back in to the center on the groove because the starting line ends up a little better outside the groove in the start. So, but I think the track's in decent shape. It's it's a little warm, but uh, you know we just got to deal with it. And he doesn't have lane choice. It's kind of a dark science all the way around. But he's making his decisions right now that will impact the run for Robert Hike. And we heard him, Mike, uh, telling one of the crew members right before we started the interview, "Let's step up the blower." He wants to put a little bit more air into the engine to make a little bit more horsepower for the conditions. If it's a little bit hotter, they'll speed that up to make the same amount of horsepower in cooler conditions. So as he continues to inspect the track and we get ready for final preparations, there is the track temperature, 108. Let's go back to Memphis. Remember when it was like 140 on the track temperature? It was oppressive. All right, here's how you qualify for the showdown. The driver earns points based on national event qualifying. It started back at Indy last year. It ended at Memphis two weeks ago. The top eight qualifiers earn their spot in the Skull Showdown. The tiebreaker for position is the quickest average of the 10 best elapsed times. And that's how the field was set. And that's what makes it so impressive about Robert Height making it. He had only 17 events. He's the number eight qualifier. Tip of the hat to Jimmy Brock and Robert Height. Let's shift gears while we've got a quick moment and let's talk to the man who's no longer out of school but going back to the head of the class warren johnson he's with dave reef you're absolutely right marty if you've got something that's from warren johnson that has schools out on it well that has now become a collector's item this is something that actually was rumored starting a few weeks ago and well it wasn't the best kept secret but warren you are back you are back with gm performance parts and we just heard from kenny bernstein and his extension with budweiser what does it mean to you to be back with gm well it was a uh, really a uh a pretty decent thing uh, that they felt that our program and their programs really had a real synergy between the two of them and for them to ask me to come back for I guaranteed them two more years of driving we got a three-year uh, program so I got the option to drive in the third year also there were some uh, insinuations maybe some inside politics what led to the initial thing but ultimately you're coming back can you comment on any of that no nah, we're not even gonna worry about any about uh, Thing. You know, you can't change history, so you never even worry about it. That's what not, not a history buff. Speaking of history, this will be Warren Johnson's 30th start here at the U.S. Nationals. His first start was here. And then let's go back and reminisce a little bit about 1984, the first of six wins. 84, I think that was uh, with the Cutlass, the flying boxcar, the silver one. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we were fortunate enough to win over Glidden in the final. Bob Glidden, geez, you guys had many a war. What did it mean to beat him on that day? Well, that was really, uh, uh, you know, like hitting the lotto. Uh, first of all, this is Glidden's home track. He did a lot of testing here, and he had a really a fabulous record here over the years. And to beat him here, I believe that was my first Indy win. You know, I was couldn't get better than that. Warren's record here, not too bad as well. A six-time champ, as we said, now number two in the qualified field. Well, and I think it's amazing. He did not have benefit of a monitor, and he knew everything. I, he probably could have told us which lane he was in back in 1984 for that race. Stay with us. We're coming right back. The Skull Showdown, first round, is coming to the line. The big go. The U.S. Nationals. It doesn't get any bigger than this. You're no one until you've won Indy. I've won it twice. And Mike Dunn has won it as well. And there are the thousands of fans along the fence line as we are back here at Mac Tools. U.S. Nationals getting ready for first round action of the Skull Showdown. Let's quickly get a word with one of those competitors, Gary Gerald. You want a sinister look when you go to the Skull Showdown? I think I got one for you right here. Oh, my goodness. That's a scary deal. Assess your chances for us, Gary Selzy. Well, I don't know right now. I mean, this is the eight best of the best, no doubt about it. But we're one of those best. And we ran really well last night. Heat of the day. 
We're looking to run a high 70 or a low 80. If it sticks and I'm on time, we should be going to next round. Go have fun. Go chase 100 grand, bud. There you go. Thanks. Okay, is he uh, accurate on the estimate as far as ET? Yeah, I don't know, man. The sun's out there right now. I think a low 80 is definitely possible, but a high 70, well, we'll have to see. The Skull Showdown. I've got a little butterfly in my stomach, and I'm not even getting behind the wheel. What's it like for these guys? They know what's at stake. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of money at stake right now, and we heard Jimmy Proc talking about the strategy of, of a run, and, and in his particular case, he wanted Robert to, to stage outside, and then once the car launched, he was going to have to get that thing towards the middle, probably about 200, 300 feet out to get into that good rubber. Now, a driver has to think about doing that, but then he also has to think about, I need to leave on time. So you, tr you, you set up that strategy going in, and it's, and it's different for a lot of different drivers depending on the lane. The left lane's probably not the same way. They may have to drive the lane a little bit different. We heard Cruz Pedregon, normally he would go in and deep stage. That means once the stage light come in, he would roll it in a little bit quicker, gives you a quicker reaction time, but you lose elapsed time. The fact that he is not qualified right now, he cannot do that. He's got to go in shallow, try to get the win, but also try to get that car qualified. Oh, and you also better be ready in case the tire smokes. Then you got to grab the brake, and then you got to get back on the throttle, and then you better not do anything wrong because then you could hit the wall, and whew, this could be really nerve wracking. All right, let's talk about the uh, starting grid because this is the way it's going to come down in the 2005 showdown. There is John Force. He is your number one qualifier over the last. 12 months, Robert Hike in 17 races gets in. There's number two, Gary Selsey. Who's he going to face? He's going to go up against Cruz Pedregon. We already know what Cruz has to take. There's Eric Medlin. He is the number three qualifier, and he comes up against the number six qualifier, Tommy Johnson Jr., in the one skull car in the sponsor's event. Del Worsham will go up against Tony Pedregon, who had that frightening moment yesterday in session two of qualifying. So the field is set, and the mentions come to life, and we're finally getting down to race action here in the first round of the Skull Showdown at Indianapolis Raceway Park. Chuck Worsham brings 8,000 horsepower to life for his son, Dell. The body will come down. The butterflies will go away the moment Dell masters the throttle. There is a... Cody Pendergrass, he's getting out of the way just in case something goes wrong again on Tony's car over in the right lane, but no problem this time. Gary, uh, what's going on with John Force? Quirky things sometimes happen in big events. A quirky thing has just happened to John Force minutes ago. He was riding his scooter up here into the staging lanes. He ran over a small bottle. It disrupted him, and he fell. He hit on his shoulder. I believe it was his left shoulder. I tried to ask him as he climbed into the car how he was feeling. He looked me in the eye and says, I got to go win around. But clearly, it looks to me like John Force is hurting. How much it may impact this run, I don't don't know, but he did tumble off his scooter just moments ago. Let's quickly get a note on Tommy Johnson. Marty, the only driver in the showdown we didn't get a chance to talk to is Tommy Johnson Jr., but just take a look at the side of this car and you can get the idea of how important the Skull Showdown is to Tommy Johnson. Remember, there were two Skull cars. Neither one of them made it into their own race a year ago, so Tommy has already climbed that hurdle. I just talked to him, strapped into the race car, and said, okay, you're here. What's the approach now? He said, it's just another run. Mike Dunn, how can that be? Well, that's the way a driver has to approach it. Otherwise, you let everything else get you. You have to just focus on it's another run that you have to do the best that you can, and that's to get a good reaction time and get that car to the finish line as quick as it's capable of doing. I'm still trying to figure out how John Force can go 330, but yet he can't ride five miles an hour on a scooter. We'll have to figure that one out. Here we go. First round. Tony got out of the groove. He had it. And Dell gets around him, 4.87 seconds at 3.14. There was Dickie Venables, who sustained those first and second degree burns yesterday in that uh, incident down the starting line. And this time he's got his pants on for the entire run. You know, it could be a situation they did not get the run because of that incident yesterday in the heat. So this was basically their first run in the heat of the day. And I'll tell you what, Tony Petragon, was had Del Worsham covered early in the run. He had a, over 300 of a second advantage off of the starting line and then picked up another two or three by 330 foot. But then right there, it moves over towards the side, gets out of the groove and puts a cylinder out, which also helped move that car way over towards the wall. And at that point, that allowed Del Worsham to drive around and get the win. Take a look there, you can see the cylinders out and boy, it pushes the car hard. 
Dell goes on to take the round win and is in the second round action. There's the celebration back by the Checker Shucks Cragen team at the starting line. And now it's time to go to work. They got 75 minutes to turn it around. We come back for Eric Medlin in the left lane. The Castro Syntec Mustang will go up against Tommy Johnson in the Skull Monte Carlo. TJ, this is his second Skull Showdown. Back in 2003, he lost on a whole shot to Whit Basemore in round number one. For Eric Medlin, his first ever showdown. His dad, John, won the showdown with Tony Pedragon behind the wheel back in 2003. This is a situation we talked about. You have to go back to the yesterday's session in the heat to kind of compare the numbers to see what kind of a setup these guys have on the car. Tommy Johnson Jr. has been running very well. He ran a 492 in the heat, but Eric Medlin, he ran a 484 in that session. Dave Reef. And already this Skull Showdown has gotten very interesting. Tony Pedregon, a former winner, now on the trailer of the six cars that are left. Only one guy has won this race. That's John Forson. As Gary just touched on John, maybe not feeling the best. So it's looking very good, like there could be a first-time winner. This race very interesting already after just one pair. Not a cloud in the sky over this racetrack. And the key for Tommy is to basically do what we heard Jimmy Proc talk about. The, the groove goes towards the center line. We saw Tony Pentagon get off to the right, spin the tires, and drop the cylinder. He's got to drive that thing to the left after the launches. Eric Medlin does it again. 4.89 seconds, 3.14 the mile an hour. TJ goes a 4.98 at 3.17. Looked like he did the job of getting back into the groove for Tommy, but just not enough grunt. But it actually looked like Tommy Johnson had to backpedal the car. It looked like it launched and it was moving over there, and I think he got out of the throttle and got back in. Maybe got felt a little bit of tire shake. Left side of your screen, you're gonna see right there. Yep, he backpedaled the car. Probably felt the thing get a little bit loose. That cost him elapsed time, but it saved him from smoking the tires. Had Eric been smoking the tires over there, TJ could have possibly won that round. But unfortunately for TJ, Eric was making a very nice run into the next round. So Medlin picks up uh, where he's been leaving off lately as he has uh, gotten very accustomed to winning rounds. As we come back trackside and get ready for John Force and Robert Hyde. And I guess we're going to find out if that uh, tumble off of the uh, moped did any damage to John. He's uh, moving both arms pretty freely. At this point, I, I would imagine the adrenaline kicks in. Yeah, I mean, once the engine starts, you're, you're going to forget about the pain. I mean, you're only in the car for a couple minutes, so you, you should be able to handle it. Guaranteeing the old match race days, John Force has driven it with some pain, so he's probably as good as anybody to be able to uh, focus on the job at hand. Let's uh, go to the far end, check in with Gary Gerald. Quick assessment of that, Brennan, how much of a relief to go to the second round in this $100,000 shoot shoot showdown, I should say. <laughs> It's a shootout, Gary. I don't even know. I've never been here before, so uh, each round win is always great. You know, for Castro Syntec, i got to put all my gear on. But uh, Oakley, everybody, Mac Tools, especially those good years, man. It's hot out here, so uh, Dad and Jason, all the guys are getting her to stick. Look at I got stuff all over you. I'm a mess. Man, you are a mess. <laughs> and so am I. <laughs> John, John Force in his 22nd showdown. No other drivers participated in more special event races than that man right there. John Forrest, like everybody else, has lane choice, and he has chosen that left-hand lane. I think it's because of the fact that right-hand lane, lane we see, you got to get that thing over towards the center, so the drivers have to do a little bit more driving in that right-hand lane. Dave Reed. For John Forrest, his 22nd start in this event to go along with the five wins. He's going up against a rookie in Robert Hyde, but keep in mind, Robert, very, very accomplished as a trap shooter. That takes tremendous amount of focus. Also, keep in mind, this team qualified for this event in only 17 races. Do you think the rookie is going to be sure? up here. We'll take a look and keep an eye on the groove because we know exactly what the strategy is. Height did exactly what he needed to do with the car. 4.82 seconds. John drifted out of the groove and ends up with a 491. 
unbelievable. The kid who qualified for this event in just 17 races, the other guys had 23, and that guy right there tunes him to a 482. And Robert Hyde drove it to a 482. That's what we're talking about. The driver has to get to the finish line as quick as it will go. Look at the car launch. He moved it over towards the center line. That thing stayed right in the middle of the groove because that lane wants to drive you over towards the wall, especially if you don't get it over there quick enough. He made the move right at the right point, got that thing stuck in the middle of the groove, and got the win. John Forrest, let's watch him. Now the car launch is out here. Same thing. Now the groove may be a little bit straighter in here, but you know these cars still want to move around. Right at that point, you see that thing sashaying towards the center line. It gets out of the groove close to the center line. It's going to get more tire spin at that point, and uh, that's one of those situations. All right, let's go on board with John. Just listen. That's how quickly it was over for John. Three years in a row now, he has been ousted by his own teammate. Two years ago, Tony Pedragon. Last year, Gary Dencham. This year, that man right there, Robert Height, puts him on the sidelines. Gary? Well, Robert, you got the job done against John. Were you aware that John fell off of his scooter just before he got in the car? No, I wasn't. Uh -uh. No, I didn't know anything about that. Shoot. Sorry to hear that. Now we'll find out. I don't know if it was anything serious or not, but certainly you're related. You're going on now. You and your teammate Eric as well. Yeah, that's good. Um, maybe we can meet in the next round, in the final. Um, just glad for Automobile Club of Southern California and Ford that we've got another car in the second round, and maybe we can do what Gary Dencham did here last year. It's tough beating up on John, but he told us to go for it, and we did. I don't even know what he ran, what I ran, anything else. Well, I think you, uh, 82 was what you ran. John, I want to know, are are you physically okay? You went down on the scooter? Hell, you can't hurt me. They tried to kill me for years. I just, I ran over a Powerade bottle in the pit. Someone dropped an empty. And I couldn't figure out why I went down. And I hit it and it just threw me down on my own noggin. Then Selzy runs up. I thought he tripped me. And then my driver whips me. God, what's this world coming to? <laughs> just want to thank Powerade and uh, all the sponsors. Uh, the new ones, Brand Source, but especially Castrol, Ford, Mac Tool, AAA. Uh, for supporting me all these years and uh, we got another race tomorrow but we got one here today to win with Eric or Robert and, and we're gonna do that right. and then we're gonna win again tomorrow I think John's all right guys yeah he got yeah. all the sponsors he's fine and Robert trying to become the fifth driver to win in his first ever start and so we get ready for Cruz Pedregon and Gary Selzy and so we are guaranteed of a first-time winner John was the only one who had won this event that was still left in the field he's on the sidelines Remember, he is not qualified, has got to run quicker than a 4.852 to just get into the 16-car field. Selzy takes the win in a 494, and you know what that means for Cruz? Bad news. He is down to one shot remaining. Now remember, he was a finalist last year here, losing to Gary Dencham on Monday. And he goes into the final session not even qualified. Cruz Petricon's car really wants to run on the left side of your screen. Just a situation where I think he's just a little bit too aggressive. It did not get out of the groove, but boy, he had some really quick early number. He was 400 of a second quicker than Gary Selzy to the 330 foot mark, but then he started spinning the tires, and that's all it, uh, Gary needed for him to get into the next round. All right, here's the semifinals in the showdown. It will be Robert Hype with the lane choice over Dell Worsham by five one hundredths of a second. Lane choice in the second matchup to Eric Medlin over Gary Selzy. We'll hear from Gary when we come back, and we'll also have more funny car action here at the Mac Tools U.S. Nationals as the session of qualifying still continues. Live here at the Mac Tools U.S. Nationals, where qualifying continues. That's right. Even though the first round of the showdown was for some big money for those eight guys, it also counted towards qualifying. So will the final. And those guys eliminated will still have one more opportunity, and that's good news for Cruz Pedragon because he is not yet in the 16-car field. And while we were in commercial break, take a look. Tim Wilkerson over on the far side over the right lane. He stops the clock 4.83 seconds, 315 miles an hour. And let's go to the far end and talk to uh, those two guys with Gary. 
Gary Selsey's driver's suit says wild thing. Was that a wild ride at 94? Oh, yeah. For a slow run, it was real wild. It started shaking the tire, and it got me over out of the groove. And normally when it does that, it knocks the tires off. But thank God NHRA has done a great job preparing this racetrack. And lane choice doesn't matter, so I stole some on there because the cruiser, you know, he'll saw you off the kneecaps. I didn't want to hear, beat by another whole shot loss. So fortunately, you know, for us, we smoked the tires, and that 92 was good enough to get us to the semis. And cruise for you, smoking the tires now puts you in the unenviable position of having one more opportunity to punch your way into this field for tomorrow's U.S. Nationals. How much pressure is that creating? Well, it's it's all pressure. Even when you're in the field, you're always trying to get better. But, you know, well, the car's been trying to run good all weekend, man. This thing is really trying to run. I, I feel bad that uh, we're actually better than what we're showing, but I think we can come out and uh, look at that computer and, uh, and Ron Douglas and Sam Shockley will look things over in the advanced car and, and uh, take a look and, uh, hey, we're, we've got a shot. That's all I can say. We've got a shot. The car can run a low 80. I just hope it doesn't get any warmer than it is now. Well, we'll ride with you when you get that opportunity later in the day. And he's not blowing smoke there, Mike. You pointed out last night during qualifying, he did have some great numbers, but the car just uh, didn't make it all the way down the track as John Force goes back into the pit area. Del Worsham's crew doing the 75-minute turnaround, trying to get ready. They're still in the showdown. Stay with us. We're coming right back. First running of the Mac Tools U.S. Nationals. That's some of the suites up on the driver's left side of the track here at Indianapolis Raceway Park. And the grandstand just about as jammed as you can find it. And uh, while we were in commercial break, let's take a look at Bob Bodie on the left side of your screen. Dale Creasy closest to you. Neither car gets down the racetrack. Dale Creasy gets it very sideways at the hit of the throttle. His career best is a 489 lap time. It takes a 485 to get in the show. So he tried to step her up. Probably put a little more clutch and horsepower into it, but the track just wouldn't hold, and he spun the tires and got her just a little bit sideways there. You mentioned the bump spot at 4.85 seconds. That is the quickest funny car field in history you're looking at right now. And leading off is uh, John Force all the way down through Whit Paysmore's 476 just to make the top half of the field. And there's Phil Burkhart on the bump spot right now, 4.852. We have a total of 25 floppers here. There are the guys that are still on the outside punching their way in. Cruz Pedregon in the 20th spot right now. And Dale Creasy in what we just showed you as he uh, was not able to make it down the course. So we've got the action going on. That's Gary Selzy's camp. Uh, they're uh, crashing to get ready. We've got to take another commercial break. Stay with us. We're coming back with more qualifying at the Mac Tools U.S. Nationals. Back here at qualifying as you ride along with John Force as things get a little hectic inside the cockpit of a funny car in NHRA Powerade Drag Racing. As uh, we are about ready to wrap things up here in our early edition, we'll be coming back to you tonight, 10.30 Eastern, 7.30 Pacific on ESPN2 and ESPN2 HD. We'll have the semifinals and the finals of the Skull Showdown and final round of qualifying in all four professional categories. And right now, Kenny Koretsky, Ron Krischer in Pro Stock, Cruz Pedregon in Funny Car, not in the field. Koretsky and Cruz were finalists last year, and they're going into the final session not qualified, Mike. Yeah, and it's going to be tough, but I like how crazy it is with the funny car points right now. I mean, Ron Force comes in here, he's number, probably going to end up number one qualifier, but as you can see, during eliminations for the Skull Showdown, he's out in the first round, so tomorrow anything can happen. That's going to do it for us, as uh, we have to make way for the LPGA. The State Farm Classic is coming up next right here on ESPN2, and there is Robert Ike as he's helping his team get ready for second round action of the Skull Showdown. Still absolutely amazing. He has qualified in just 17 races. For Mike Dunn, Dave Reed, Gary Gerald, and Dave McClellan and our entire ESPN2 crew, I'm Marty Reed. Thanks so much for joining us here live at the 51st Mac Tools U.S. Nationals. There is, coming up next, the LPGA State Farm Classic. We'll see you at 10.30 p.m. tonight for final qualifying from Indy. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For more, log on to ESPN.com. So long for now, everybody.